Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. Um, to start off with, would you just like to say your name and where you are? My name is Neela Miller, and I'm in Acton, Massachusetts. Okay. And you may know the first big question that we have is really just kind of right to the heart of it. Who are you? I mean, who are you as a person, as a human being? And you can talk about any aspects of yourself that you want, your values, your beliefs, your, your characteristics. Big, big question. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, on my Facebook, what I have <clears throat> under my uh, picture is I am a creature of infinite possibilities. So that's my first response to that question. And then I have this amazing genetic inheritance. Uh, I was, and my parents were Greenwich Village Bohemians. So I come from a family of artists and musicians, humorists, book lovers, and so on. My mom was a dancer, a writer, and a painter. She was also a fantastic entertainer and cook, a great housekeeper. Uh, and she graduated uh, with honors from Hunter College when she was 77, because uh, when she was younger, she couldn't, uh, she had to work. And uh, during that time at Hunter, she wrote a couple of books and I helped her put together uh, some books of poetry that she'd done. And she also worked on Madison Abbey who was an executive secretary and graphic designer for the Tea Council. My dad loved poetry, words, and was both, I would say, a logophile and a philo uh, philologist or philo philologian, I'm not sure which one it would be, and told me before he died that if he had, had to do it over again, he'd do that professionally. <clears throat> as it was, he studied law, but worked um, as a fundraiser for most of his adult life. And uh, since he couldn't get a job in a legal firm, it was during the depression. Uh, he played violin, had a beautiful uh, tenor voice, and knew all of the uh, popular songs of the time. And so he'd sing a lot. My aunt was a pianist, and uh, my uncles were also musicians, and one was an art curator. I inherited all of this, and it showed up in me from an early age. I, 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 and really throughout my life. Uh, I started music lessons at a very young, we moved from the Greenwich Village thing up to the Bronx, <clears throat> if you know New York City. And uh, uh, just in time for me to do uh, a kindergarten, to start kindergarten. And um, my aunt and another and a family friend became my piano teachers. So really most of the time during my childhood, um, I was taking piano lessons. And um, my aunt and my mother took me to all the old original Broadway musicals, which I've always loved ever since then. And I've always had a partiality to the originals. Um, I went to the High School of Music and Art. I was a music student uh, specializing in voice. I also studied conducting and composing. Um, and uh, I've been a songwriter and a composer most of my life. <clears throat> I lived across from a park where I learned to uh, roller skate and to play all kinds of games, jacks, that's uh, with the little things. I don't even know if people know these words anymore. Oh yeah, no, uh, the, the little spiky metal yeah, thing. Spiky the metal, thing. Yeah. Potsy, do you know what potsy is? That's where you have two numbers, one number, two numbers, one number, two numbers, okay. and you hop and jump, you throw your skate key. Right. That's and then you have to God. pick it up on one leg, you know, mm -hmm. so, and, and um, also uh, loved uh, 
games, pick up sticks, chess, checkers, uh, all kinds of board games, which uh, we played a lot in my family, card games. And then always loved being in other worlds, especially like fairy tales, myths. Uh, I I'm telling you all of this because really it, it answers the question, who am I? And you'll see how these pieces come together. Um, I loved Mary Poppins. I love when she took the kids into the drawing and uh, you know, all kinds of other stories involving, uh, uh, involving like entering alternate worlds. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then when I got to college, I went to Antioch College, which had a work, work study program. And I was a theater major. I wanted to do one thing that my family hadn't done, <laughs> even though they were uh, hams, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and in uh, doing theater, in addition to doing a lot of acting, uh, I did directing, lighting design, I did music, I did costuming, I did all kinds of things that used a lot of these, uh, these creative processes. So I call myself a creativist because what fascinates me is the process of creativity, regardless of the medium. And I move around from writing, I've written a number of books, uh, to doing artwork. Uh, and right now, uh, this is my show and tell. <laughs> right now I'm doing, uh, uh, I, I started, uh, I'm doing an art class with a group of people on Zoom. And uh, each time I try to do something different, so this last time it was paper folding and then using the uh, both sides because now you have three dimensions mm -hmm. uh, and doing collages and uh, using each plane as a separate little place to, uh, to draw and stuff. And then how do you bring it all together so that it works, you know? So I do a lot of mixed media art like this and all different kinds. I you think it sounds very multi-dimensional. <laughs> it's just the word that. That's right. Now you can see behind me uh, in the opposite wall is a painting of my mother's. Mm -hmm. And then on my bulletin board, I have all different kinds of things that I've been working on. So, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, so much later in life, and I, I'll talk about this separately, uh, when I was uh, introduced to the virtual world of, of Second Life, it immediately caught my fancy. Here was a chance to go into a three-dimensional al alternate world, which was, of course, something that I loved from the time I was a young child through mm -hmm. reading and books, or, and also through, uh, I lived across the street from a park, which is where I did all of those uh, mm -hmm. outdoor things. And uh, Fr my friends and I used to go underneath these uh, large trees and bushes and uh, create homes out of um, acorn shells and sticks and all kinds of things. Uh, we would actually create these little worlds uh, and then play different characters. Um, and so I've been exploring that for at least, I don't know, 12 or 13 years. So I will pause and see what, what's mm -hmm. the next thing you want to ask me. So. No, I mean, that, that all, I, I never question what people answer when, when I ask them who they are. I mean, like the answer is the answer. So, but I, I'm wondering, I mean, you said creativity, but is there any other particular value that you would say that you sort of organize around or principle in yourself, in your life? Yeah, I have several of them. One is from the great Shakespeare, to thine own self be true. Mm. Try not to do anything that you won't enjoy, if at all possible. And that's especially true in my later life. Of course, creative process is a primary value of mine. Mm -hmm. Lifelong learning. Matching skills with needs. Um, those, are, I, th I, I think that those are the main ones. 
And of course, they affect how I provide service to other people. And, you know, we can get into that later. But um, yeah, I would say those are my main values. And another question would be, what comes to mind as a particular event or a set of circumstances in your life? I mean, you've talked a bit about your family, your origins, but is there is there a particular event that you would say really um, impacted or shaped you in, in a significant way? Well, I can way? tell you about the event that led me to bec uh, becoming a, a gestaltist. Uh, when I was in college, you know, I said we had a, had a work study program. So mm -hmm. you, paid, you, you spent one semester on campus and then you went on to a job for three months, then you came back onto campus and so on. And one of my first jobs was uh, with Scribner's Bookstore in New York City, very well-known bookstore, 57th Street. And my job there was doing research uh, up upstairs above the uh, sales part of the store uh, for people who wrote in and wanted to know where certain poem lines came from, certain quotations and so on. And it was my job to uh, find, get that information and then send it to them. So but, you were like the original Google. <laughs> yeah, really. I never thought of it that they way. They send you the quote and I have to give them the reference. <laughs> uh, but at the lunch break uh, at, at noon, I would be, I'd go down on the arts and psychology balcony. And my job was to relieve the people who were the salespeople there so they could go out to lunch. And when there were no uh, people uh, or uh, customers in the store, I would look at the books that were on this balcony and pull out ones at random that looked interesting or that I'd never heard of or, you know, whatever. And uh, one day I came across Pearl's Hefferlein and Goodman's book on gestalt therapy. So I opened this book and I start to read and I have an epiphany. I'm thinking, this is how my brain is organized. These people are speaking directly to me. I love the combination of didactic and experiential material in the book that you could actually do exercises, you know. Mm -hmm. So I read that one from cover to cover. And then uh, I got all of other, uh, all of Pearls' books, Ego, Hunger, and Aggression. and. Uh, and I know that another epiphany was uh, when uh, in Gestalt therapy verbatim, because it still stays with me. He's working with a guy in his dream, and the guy's dream is that uh, uh, he's walking up a steep mountain path. I don't know if you remember this. And Pearl says to him, uh, be the path. What would the path say? And the guy says, all day, people are walking over me. And I thought, oh, Jesus. And that's when I understood the uh, accumulation and the assimilation of dissociated parts. Mm -hmm. And that also has been a theme for me throughout my life. Global thinking, walking in another person's shoes, taking positions that are not your fixed positions and exploring them. Uh, of course, Gestalt prepares you beautifully for this, but I do it in all kinds of other ways and I'll describe that later. Okay. Um, yeah. So yeah, that was, that was an amazing thing, but I didn't become a Gestalt therapist right away. Mm -hmm. I be, I was an English teacher. You know, I still I have that all the word love and the uh, I did a lot of work with dramatic literature with with Shakespeare and making it palatable for kids who had no idea who Shakespeare was. And they assigned me a creative writing class mm -hmm. with kids who wanted to write and loved to write but really didn't know very much about it. And from reading these Gestalt books, I had this idea 
And I started teaching writing in a way that I'm sure that nobody had done before, which was to have these kids create a main character and then become the character and start to describe their world from that character's point of view and then become all the animate and inanimate things in that world. And it was like doing dream work, mm -hmm. but it was coming from these kids' imaginations. They loved it. They found that by writing this way, it didn't feel like a chore and that things occurred to them that wouldn't have occurred to them in any other way. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't wait to get to, to class, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I developed this way of teaching uh, creative writing and, uh, you know, and then other people got curious about it and were interested in, uh, years later, I wrote uh, a manual called Being Alive, Creative and Emotional Intelligence Tools for People Professional. And it had, it's filled with uh, sensory tools of all kinds that can help people um, work with whatever population they are working with and mm -hmm. enhance what they're doing. So basically I brought together my arts background, my writing background, teaching, uh, therapy, uh, a, a group facilitation, and so on. And uh, was very, very lucky that I discovered through who I was, what my vocation was early in my adult life, mm -hmm. and then kept it going throughout my adult life in many different forms. Hmm. I, I'm curious who you have run into on this path, who come to mind as people <laughs> who have uh, influenced you or affected you or bounced off of you in some way. Uh, well, I'm fortunate in that I, I was very much involved with the human potential movement. Mm -hmm. And I was a frequent presenter at uh, the Association for Humanistic Psychology conferences. So I knew all of the pioneers. I knew Fritz Perls personally. He gave his last full training workshop at my house in Lexington. <clears throat> uh, I knew Carl Rogers, Virginia Satir. I knew all of the people who were doing pioneering work. I knew them personally, I studied with them and many of them became friends. Uh, so it's a very long list, but I, I would like to say that, uh, that there were some uh, standout people that had a profound influence on me, certainly uh, Fritz, Fritz Perls. And I wrote a whole anecdote uh, about him, which that, that would be a specific experience too that I could tell you about. But uh, John Hyder, who was, uh, have you ever heard of John Hyder? We, at the Esalen Institute? There was I don't a whole, think so, honestly. You know about the Esalen Institute, yeah. which is, uh, okay. So I was very uh, involved there for a while and he was uh, one of the, their main teachers there. And then he was a uh, teacher for us at our New England Gestalt Institute, uh, doing all kinds of work with us. And I worked with him at Esalen and uh, amazing guy. Uh, and then very much uh, Arnold Mendel, who developed, who was a Jungian, a physicist, a shaman, uh, a genius, who developed a whole field called uh, process-oriented psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was, uh, he spent a lot of time in Switzerland at the Jung Institute, and then he started developing this neo-Jungian path. And that he and his cohort uh, were, were instrumental in my 
really combining Gestalt work with process oriented psychology work. And I myself went to Switzerland and was there for several weeks um, in a whole uh, training program. <clears throat> and I loved it because they also played with fairy tales and with art stuff and with, you know, all the things that I loved anyway. And I learned a lot. Uh, and so Arnie and Amy, who, who do uh, workshops all over the world and used to be able to come to New England to do stuff. And I've had hundreds of hours with them, uh, as I did with many, many different Gestaltists. I was in a very fortunate position because one of my first main jobs was with the Associates for Human Resources. Um, I was their institute manager. So it was my job to invite every Gestaltist I could get my hands on to come to AHR to give public workshops and then to stay with us and do training with us. And so I, I have to say that I have done training uh, probably with a dozen different prominent Gestalt people. Uh, I was very, very lucky in, in that respect that uh, the <clears throat> AHR was one of the, it's the Associates for Human Resources, was one of the main um, learning institutes uh, for humanistic psychology on, on the uh, East Coast, uh, in, the, in the Northeast. And so we brought not only gestaltists, but bioenergetics people. And I mean, all, you know, all the different categories of, mm -hmm. of people. And they would do public workshops and then work with the staff. And I'm curious what it is. I mean, it sounds like this is obviously a, a huge part of your life and is really interwoven with a lot of different things. But do you have a favorite part of gestalt? And that sounds like such a simplistic question, but is there a yeah, particular Gestalt piece art. of it that you've fallen in love with? Gestalt art therapy. Uh, like? Danny Ryan was one of the people that I met. And uh, I learned from her and she also learned from me. So we had a kind of a peer relationship where we fed off of each other's stuff. So, you know, I had her book on Gestalt art therapy and it was a, just a perfect marriage of who I was with what I was interested in in Gestalt. So I went to places like Australia and, and trained people who were in those Gestalt institutes in how to incorporate arts processes into their work as Gestaltists. And I've also did it with the coaching community and with uh, what I would call broadly people professionals, not just therapists. I did a lot of work myself in corporate environments using arts processes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, it's very difficult with a person like me to ask for favorites because everything I have done, I have loved. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been such a natural amalgamation of who I am with what I'm interested in. Uh, that it, it, it's very hard to, to pull out, but you know, if I, if someone had a gun to my head, you, you could I would say it would be uh, gestalt art therapy. Okay, gestalt yeah, I, I certainly wouldn't put a gun to your head. I mean, I just look at these sort of as figure questions. Like, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot more, but it's always sort of what pops, you know? So I would say that my specialty was the combining of creative expression of all kinds with gestalt, mm -hmm. art, movement, sound, uh, and that I loved making up uh, experiments for people mm -hmm. to do, you know, using all of this, this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent a little time also, um, well, I was with the, uh, Gestalt Institute of New England out of uh, AHR. We had a whole 
little institute there. And then GISC, uh, 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 the, Nev the Nevises, Ed and Sonia Nevis, who had a place on Cape Cod and in Wellfleet. And Ed uh, did the organization development and Gestalt part. And Sonia did all the training of, of therapists and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I did some uh, stuff on creativity uh, at their center. Mm -hmm. And years after I um, got into all this, I had a book of Ed's on uh, organization development and Gestalt, which is also very interesting to me. How to work with organizations using Gestalt, mm -hmm. which I did a lot. I discovered that my brother, may he rest in peace, had written the preface to Ed Nevis's book. And I never realized that. So my brother, you know, specialized in organizational behavior and psychology. I mean, uh, these <laughs> kinds of crossings are, are, they're so interesting and fun when they happen. Mm -hmm. You know, these kind of, uh, unexpected uh, synchronicities. Mm -hmm. uh, hmm. Well, I, I do have another question, a little bit sort of less about the doing and a little bit more personal. Some people don't feel really interested in answering this, but it, it's about how you experience yourself as a woman and how you experience your gendered self. And I mean, you've, okay. you've been in several different contexts and <laughs> In, you know, in a few decades at this point, so I'm, I'm curious. All right, what I have not mentioned yet is that I had 30 years of experience working with transgendered people. Okay. And I wrote this book, the very first book, with a gestalt slant to it called Counseling mm -hmm. in Gender Lab. If you look at the, uh, I usually ask a people- A guide what for you and your transgendered clients. Okay, sorry. You ask what? I ask people what they see on this cover. And it's very interesting that uh, most women see that this is the same person. Mm -hmm. A lot of men do not think, they think the man is a separate person from the woman on the cover. Mm -hmm. But this person who helped design this cover, that was me, younger, mm -hmm. uh, used this book to come out to his family and his world. Mm. So working with transgenders, uh, I did a lot of uh, workshops in the old days for cross-dressers, males who um, had discovered their femicides, uh, teaching them what it is women do in, when they're in groups together, how they respond to each other and so on, which they had absolutely no sense about at all because they'd been trained to have poker faces and not do much re reacting at all. Mm -hmm. and, and there was a sense of segregation in what you're saying as well. Like, you know, the men with their brandy in the parlor and the women somewhere else. Well, and, and in business settings, Right. That you're not supposed to let on what it is you're thinking or feeling because someone can take advantage of you and then you lose your position of power. Okay. But m women have all this relational stuff. I mean, their bodies are made to feed another human being, to carry another human being inside them, you know, which is something that men are not privy to. So, so this whole question about, you know, uh, being, being a woman, um, uh, again, I have to bring in this, this global perspective because from having worked with transgendered people and uh, who have moved <clears throat> from one gender experience to another, and it wasn't until later, I wrote this book, uh, it was published in 1996, mainly cross dressers uh, showed up at the, uh, you know, the, the event was Fantasia Fair in Provincetown, which was an open town, one of the few really open towns in this country. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I, you know, I was doing all these workshops to help these guys develop the, their femme sides. Now, later on, uh, transsexuals started showing up both ways, mm -hmm. femmes to men, men to femmes. And uh, uh, so that was a whole other broadening out of, uh, and uh, when I wrote the book too, in my preface, I talk about, well, what did this have to do with me? And why was I so fascinated with, with this field? I was introduced to it by a leader of the community who I met actually at an AHP conference, uh, Ariadne Kane. Uh, I brought him to AHR to do some stuff with my trainees. And then uh, we did things at a con AHP conference together. Mm -hmm. Fascinating experience. That's another whole anecdote. And then uh, he brought me to Fantasia Fair to work with people, um, you know, doing um, personal development groups, therapy mm -hmm. groups, coaching. Um, and it was, uh, it was an amazing thing uh, because I felt like I learned a lot about myself. Uh, about fantasies I'd had about being uh, sexually being a male, which uh, especially when I didn't have a, a, a male sex partner in my life, you know, and then having these women's clothes over this fantasy, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it, it was like a, a, a partner of what it was that these people experienced. Mm -hmm. Really, in their lives, um, you know, I'm not sure what. If I look up at the camera light, mm -hmm. is that when you, it looks like I'm looking at? You yeah, know? but I think everybody at this point understands that eyes anywhere on the screen are coming through. <laughs> okay, I've, I've right. given up on that. <laughs> Don't get point. Me, yeah, gets me confused. No, no, no. Anyway, you're definitely uh, you're here. <laughs> So, so for me, it's not, uh, you know, uh, the, the woman question, it's the <laughs> gender question. It's okay. like, how do we have the fluidity? And now, of course, huge fluidity. And I'm having such trouble getting used to using the word they for a singular person. Mm -hmm. From my English teaching background, you know, it's so painful to me and yet I understand it but when I wrote my book in the mid 90s I said right at the beginning we have a dilemma with language because these pronouns do not explain or express the all of the variations along the gender spectrum that I have in yeah. contact with. And we need a linguist, we need a Noam Chomsky, we need somebody who's going to uh, take a look at this. And I said, but because I don't have anything to work with uh, other than she and he, I will alternate them mm -hmm. throughout this book. So that's, that's the way I dealt with that dilemma, but I brought up that very problem. So now, it's so fascinating, Heather and everybody, to see what these young people are doing mm -hmm. in trying to craft language that expresses who they are and what they want to be called. And uh, uh, so, you know, because of my visit, life experience of working with transgender people, uh, it, it's, it's a much more complex uh, question than who am I as a woman? Of course. Uh, although I cer certainly identify as a woman as she and her, but there are many, many layers to that from, from this work. Um, yeah. Hmm. And, and can I ask another question? I don't ask everyone about this, but you, you said a word just before we started recording, you said the word legacy. So I'm also curious how you're experiencing your age, yourself at this age. 
Because well, I mean, like I see, a lot of people make see, assumptions about gender and sexuality. Yeah. A lot of people also make assumptions about age. That's and I, I, I'm curious. Well, I'm a little vain because of course I look quite a bit younger than I, and then my 85, I've got very smooth skin. Mm -hmm. You know, that's also a genetic legacy. My mother was always taken from my sister and my daughter who's in her early sixties also, you know, uh, looks uh, probably 15 years younger than she is. Mm -hmm. So that's just, that's a genetic inheritance. But the experience? Uh, and uh, the other thing is that, of course, I get feedback all the time uh, that my energy is the energy of a much younger person uh, mm -hmm. than, than the 85-year-olds that a lot of people know. Yes. Um, so I don't even think of myself. I mean, I, I have a kind of... Uh, ego pride, I guess, in the fact that I am 85 and I've had a huge amount of life experience uh, so that when I answer these questions or I'm talking about all this stuff, uh, it's understandable uh, that, uh, that my age uh, puts me in a position of referring to all kinds of stuff. I mean, I was born in 1935 when we still had ice boxes and the milkman delivered bottles outside the door, you know. I mean, I've lived through a complete change. Now, my mother, it's interesting too, was way ahead of her time. And so, very much like that. You know, she, 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 she went to college when she was 77. Uh, she, she was always at the growing edge of things. Mm -hmm. And so I never personally had the idea that you're limited by the number. Uh, I always saw it as an advantage. I mean, if you live a long life, then you have many more uh, learning experiences and uh, lots more enjoyment and also have to deal with a lot of crap, <laughs> you know, uh, but because I am, uh, what I, I say, I have a happy brain. Mm -hmm. I've always been a happy person. So internally, I'm greatly happy. Externally, the world is in a mess and I feel a lot of compassion and empathy for people who are struggling, struggling all the time. I should also mention that because I grew up in New York City and I went to a fully integrated camp in the 40s with as many black kids or we called blacks Negroes at the time, mm -hmm. because the camp director really wanted to make sure that uh, this was multicultural, multiracial, multiethnic, and so on. So from an early time, I was exposed to mixed groups of people and uh, at the High School of Music and Art also, very integrated. What we cared about was people's talent, really not so much what race they were or, or whatever, only in so far as it affected what they were creating. Mm -hmm. um, my uh, closest friend happens to be a black woman. Uh, I, I, so, so this whole thing about uh, racism, I have a very different take on it or experience in my life from lots of white people that I know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it, uh, I'm also in a Unitarian church, mm -hmm. which for people who don't know is a kind of non-dogmatic uh, religion that actually uh, encourages people to think for themselves to figure out what they believe in a community of spirit. 
uh, to, to be of service um, and uh, to do everything that you can, if possible, with love and with a, with a loving heart. I, so I loved that, you know, when I, when I discovered that uh, religion, I wanted to be part of the spiritual community, <clears throat> uh, but not one that told me what to think and what to believe. I, I don't imagine it would be easy to tell you what to think or what to believe. I'm getting that impression. It might it's, not go too well. That's true. So, so your question about age and legacy, uh, I mean, for me, it has, has more to do, well, here's, here's something of interest. If you had, had asked me, well, what is it that people say about you most often that would be part of your life experience or your legacy? And the answer really is clear because it has happened over and over again that I inspire people. Hmm. They're inspired by my constant uh, looking toward what is the next thing that I can offer or uh, learn or uh, inspire other people to experiment with. So this whole thing about being a creativist is uh, that what excites me the most is inspiring other people to be creative. Mm -hmm. I know already that I'm creative, you know, that I can do this and that, but, but to have a group of people like I do on Zoom every few months and inspire them to try things that they've never tried before and then to be, be willing to share that. And then uh, using Gestalt in different ways, that is what's, what really floats my boat. Now, I haven't even talked about Second Life yet because uh, I think that that's a really interesting part too and is also part of my legacy. I'm curious what that is. I, I'm not familiar with the term, honestly. <laughs> Second Life is a virtual world mm -hmm. that you can get to through a viewer on your computer. Okay. The viewer, um, there are several different ones, but if you go to secondlife.com, they take you through the steps of joining. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a viewer that is separate from their viewer, which is called Firestorm, which most people use. Mm -hmm. And you can download it either for your Mac or for your PC or for your, what is it called, Linux or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you can log in to this three-dimensional world. So it's like you're in your own movie. You create an avatar that represents you. Uh, and there are thousands of venues all over this world doing all kinds of stuff. Now, of course, what attracted me, I heard about it actually from one of my transgender friends, uh, is uh, the creativity that you can uh, create all kinds of things. You own what you create, not the people who uh, own the business of the viewer. Um, there are educational groups, there are uh, people raising funds for all kinds of um, diseases, like the uh, Michael Fox's and, and the Parkinson's thing. There are all kinds of events. You can go to concerts, uh, to theater performances, to dance recitals, and and they think they're fairly sophisticated. Mm -hmm. like in the movements and so on. You can use chat or you can use your voice. Mm -hmm. um, so I took my uh, skill set from my physical life and I brought it in 
to Second Life and started using the technology there, like the building technology. Under the build program, you have all of these different geometric shapes that you can make things with mm -hmm. and put them on the screen. I hope that that whoever's watching this understanding what I'm talking about. But I'm, I'm actually remembering having heard another friend tell me about some of this. I just didn't register. The, I don't think I was quite ready to imagine a whole second layer of, of life. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, for one thing, you get free exposure. As an artist, you can bring in Mm -hmm. uh, pictures of your actual artwork, mm -hmm. put them in a virtual gallery, mm -hmm. people can come and see them, and then you can tell them what your website is, and they can go and they can, so you can, uh, uh, and the same with musicians and writers of all kinds, mm -hmm. uh, you can get exposure that you would never get otherwise, right. and meet all kinds of people who are in interested in what you're doing uh, so it's a it's a wonderful way for people in, and there are therapists in there coaches mm -hmm. uh, you know people who work with people uh, I've done a lot of individual coaching so but let me just describe what I what I do here it'll make sense to you uh, based on the other stuff I've talked about uh, so I developed a uh, process called symbolic modeling. Now, I know that there are other people, there are people who wrote a book called Metaphors in Mind, who use that same terminology, but I use it differently. I have people make symbolic models rather than immersive things like, uh, I mean, most people who use the building tools make buildings or landscapes or objects, furniture, all kinds of stuff like that. I use it symbolically and metaphorically to explore the self, to mm -hmm. explore relationships, to explore ideas, because educators can use this with students that they bring in mm -hmm. to explore, um, you know, characters in history or or concepts in philosophy, mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of things, uh, and go uh, have uh, new perspectives or insights that you would never get from just thinking and talking alone. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I like to do show and tell on these things, because mm -hmm. I can describe what I'm doing, but if I can show it to you, then you should have a much better idea it's it's lovely. I mean, we've had several artists, you know, have just exactly what you just did, and it's it, it's very enriching. That's right. That's right. So people can get ideas about it. Hmm. Uh, these days, you know, I'm I'm uh, retired, but I'm busier than ever because I'm teaching all kinds hmm. of classes in the Second Life. Uh, people can tip you, there are tip jars and so on, but I'm not doing it for money. Mm -hmm. But I pay two people, uh, my program manager, who does uh, recruitment for me for my programs, and my tech manager, who does all the technical stuff that I don't know how to do and I don't want to know. Mm -hmm. you know. And these two people and I meet on a regular basis to plan out what programs we're going to be offering. I have a group called Octagon, colon, uh, Creative Exploration, and people can join that group and then they will get notices mm -hmm. about uh, different things that I'm doing that they might be interested in. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the short. <laughs> it, I mean, it's, it's incredible. I mean, I'm, I am a huge fan of the, the distance communication like I, I, I'm a child of the internet that was just part of my my communication set of options from I had the internet in my bedroom when I was 16. Sure. So I, I'm wondering what you think because this is this is a whole business model but not not in like a financial sense it's a whole structure it, it's a whole world it's a whole level of opportunities and I'm wondering what you think that can mean for therapy 
and for human connection. I have tried like hell. I'm hoping that some of the people who watch this would, would be interested in coming in. We have mentors who can help people mm -hmm. with the technical aspects of just being able to move around the world. I mean, you can fly there, you know, in addition to walking and sitting <laughs> and so on. You can swim underwater. There's a whole uh, community. Mm -hmm of mermen and mermaids who live underwater, <laughs> you know. You're, you're describing so many of the subtleties and this world of fantasy and this in between, and it's so real. And it's just, I mean, it drives me crazy. I hit my face against the computer often when people just treat this as like on or off and, you know, oh, I can't hear you. It's like, oh God, there, there's so <laughs> much more to it than this. So and just, I, I wanna yeah. ask your question about mm -hmm. I think that especially in the times that we're living in now, that second life is a perfect place for people to work virtually because you can use your voice. You can move around the space. You can have people uh, working with the empty chair. You can have people doing these building experiments. They can also do drawings, at their workstation and then upload them so that you can look at the drawings together. Uh, uh, you can do relational work. I've done works with, with couples there. And yeah. for therapists uh, who are you know, trying to make a living, they, they can also negotiate a fee mm -hmm. that will be paid in what the, the currency is called Lindens, but you can also uh, change the Lindens to dollars. Hmm. or they can pay in PayPal. You know, wow. have, have so it, it is connected to the real world. <laughs> yes, and so when I've done individual work, mm -hmm. I have negotiated with people. I will never turn people away who are like broke and need the help. Mm -hmm. But there are other people who have a lot of money and they, mm -hmm. they are um, very capable. Mm -hmm. of paying, you know, like, uh, never more, I, the most I got paid was $90. Uh, you know, and my usual fee was like 125, 150, somewhere in that area. But I do not, I'm not interested in using Second Life as a money maker. but I'm telling other therapists that if you want to come in and try creating a uh, and bring your people in that's another important thing don't try to find clients who are already in second life they've already found their whoever they want to work with you need to bring in your own clients so the idea would be for you to become very comfortable using the world so that you can then help other people learn the basics of using the world uh, so Heather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm remembering this whole other conversation that I just was not ready to understand. Somebody else, I was like, I, I sort of get it, but I'm not quite there yet. And I think being locked in my house for six months with two kids at this point has made me yeah, yeah, no, do the, you know, create a certain stage of life, of course. Well, no, but I just mean it now makes me almost ready to be like, okay, I think I've exhausted this dimension and I'm ready to add a few layers. Well, and, and we know that uh, people are exploring virtuality much more than they were before. Many more people have joined Second Life Yes, it's, it's this. becoming mainstream. Yes, and I'm hoping actually that it stays as an element in our lives because, mm -hmm. boy, I love a teaching on Zoom mm -hmm. because you can see people's facial expressions mm -hmm. and their reactions. I can tell when someone's uh, mystified by something or that I have to clarify a direction. Uh, the same thing with... Uh, quote, going to church, mm -hmm. uh, instead of looking at the backs of people's heads in the pews, I'm seeing people's faces and I much prefer it actually. Mm -hmm. What I've discovered during this quarantine is that physically it, it doesn't affect me at all. It, it's very much like my life was before. Mm -hmm. I'm used to being at home 
doing all of these projects on the computer or, or in my physical space. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it simply doesn't bother me, but I've been fascinated by this whole virtuality. And so that, uh, you know, I mean, the answer to your question is, I, I hope that therapists, coaches, all kinds of people professional discover not just the social media or the virtuality of Zoom, FaceTime, mm -hmm. uh, and Skype, all of which I use with different mm -hmm. people, but the uh, three-dimensionality Mm -hmm. the virtual world. Now, uh, Second Life is the most developed. It's been around for, I think it's now 17, 18 years. Mm -hmm. So they've worked on a lot of the books and so on. But there are now easy access, open uh, 3D worlds that you can get to right through your browser. Mm -hmm. And you can just Google, you know, uh, open sims or a 3D worlds with browser and you'll get, you'll get different ones. Mm -hmm. um, there's one called cyberspace that somebody I know in Second Life has developed. A lot of the people from Second Life also do open sim stuff. Mm -hmm. I just stick to Second Life because it's what I know. My clientele are in Second Life. I don't, um, I have trained some people who've come in, but there's a lot of resistance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean, people have find it hard to get on Zoom. This is this is a whole other level. Well, uh, in terms of yeah. resistance, I mean, yeah, getting into uh, mm -hmm. you know learning this uh, virtual world. But of course, once you, it's like everything else. It's so easy when you know how. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, the, the piano lessons at first are never fun, but the actual being able to play, that's a whole that's, other thing. That's right. And yeah. so you go step by step. We even created a self-guided orientation uh, venue so that people can do it in their own time and can do one step at a time and just keep coming back to the place. And they, they will learn how to do all of the basic stuff on their own if they want to. I, I'm just fascinated and loving the fact that you at 85 are schooling me on your digital three-dimensional <laughs> virtual world. I think this is amazing and I'm loving this. And in other ways, I'm a Luddite still. Mm -hmm. I have had a computer since 1984. Mm -hmm. File transfers are so difficult for me. <laughs> transferring files from one place to another or like asking you about this interview and how mm -hmm. this can be put in different places mm -hmm. uh, it's still it's very difficult for me mm -hmm. uh, and other things i'm a whiz at and mm -hmm. uh, no, uh, you know people my age very few of them are mm -hmm. witnesses at this stuff yeah. and it just does not everyone have the not everyone has the passion or the interest yeah. in sort of making that creative adaptation. But I'm just, I'm looking at this sort of coming back to some of the first things you were saying, you know, about, about creativity, about expression. And I, the word that comes to mind is depth. I mean, just finding another layer and another layer. And I think that's, that's right. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'm thinking about not also strengths. Like I would mm -hmm. say uh, my, my strengths are my, uh, well, I have a lot, uh, the ability to, to empathize or put myself in, in positions that aren't necessarily my own mm -hmm. and to help others do this. Mm -hmm. Because when you have that, it's kind of a uh, field theory thing Absolutely. Uh, that you can't occupy two positions at the same time in a field. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, when people are trying to uh, work with very difficult uh, problems like climate change, for instance. I did a whole program on that um, in Second Life, and I also have videos. I have all kinds of videos. Um, I always ask people to come out of their fixed positions and try like a dozen other positions that are not theirs 
and argue from those positions. And what they discover is that there's always a small percentage of them that is that other position. Mm -hmm. But until they give themselves permission to argue from that position, and then I have everyone else build arguments for these positions, mm -hmm. they are not prepared to deal with people from in other positions. Once they do this work, and this is a gestalt thing too, it's you become each of these positions. Mm -hmm. Projection and inclusivity and all of that. That's mm -hmm. right. You are in a much better position to tackle the larger program of, you know, what is it that we do? Mm -hmm. This problem of, of climate change, mm -hmm. uh, at least in people's attitudes and being able to talk with other people. Mm -hmm. Like one of the great experiences I had was to invite a fundamentalist to lunch. Uh, a particular kind of fundamentalist or? A Christian evangelical fundamentalist who is, uh, because I had uh, uh, attitudes about that. Okay. Like, yeah. stay away from me, you know? It was wonderful. I, pro I don't want to take the time, take the time, but it, 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 uh, this, uh, it illustrates the value of this strength of being mm -hmm. able to take different positions. All right. I'm very generous with resources and with support. Mm -hmm. It's probably obvious from what I've said too. Mm -hmm. I will, uh, uh give people, uh, materials. I will, help people with things that they're uh, ruminating on. Uh, and uh, money has really nothing to do with it. I have a wicked sense of humor and I use it a lot to make a lot of things bearable for myself and for other people. You know already that I'm extremely creative intellectually and artistically. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful uh, thus far that I haven't developed any signs of dementia. Occasionally I'll forget a word, but so will you. <laughs> I'm very positive and optimistic. And I do believe that there are ways, even in the, in the crummiest kinds of situations, to, to make headway. Mm -hmm. I, um, I have the ability to say no if and when necessary, I can set boundaries. And I inspire others to go beyond what they think they're capable of. I would say those are my main strengths. I'm peeking because I made a little list. And there are negatives too. There are negatives, I would say. I'm, it's important for people to own up like a certain person we know does not own up to anything. Uh, 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 a lot of these have flip sides to them, don't you find? Yeah, like I, I tend not to ask people about their shadows. I just, I just assume that they're there, but I don't go into them. Yeah, well, I don't need to, but, uh, but I, uh, that idea, I mean, I could say in some ways I'm a selfish person. I put my own needs before other people's uh, and then we'll make room for them. Uh, well, I mean, I they can look they at say that. you're supposed to put your own oxygen mask on first, right? So Yes, yes. I mean, uh, you can look at that, again, both ways. But uh, I have certain resistances. I resist exercise, even though I know it's good for me, except for dancing. I, uh, I maintain an omnivore status, even though I know, uh, I, you know, I understand how harmful the meat industry is. I have cut down, I've cut way down, but I still like my meat. You know, I, I, um, I'm pretty blunt and direct in my communication. If, if other people don't have fairly strong egos, they could get bruised by that. I remember I, I was listening to one of your other people talk about that as well. 
But again, I see that both as strength and as a negative from time to time, uh, that I have to be aware of other people who are more sensitive and be able to uh, gauge the way I communicate if I want my message to get across and it, uh, for it to feel loving uh, rather than bruising. I find it hard to resist taking leadership when I feel that those around me don't have the requisite skills. Um, and yet I'm a strong believer in supporting people in becoming leaders. So sometimes there's a little bit of, of push pull, pull on that. I know you understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, I don't know what you might've seen in me, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, but but all of these all of these uh, strengths can have weaknesses, and weaknesses can have st strengths. It's the kind of a, the yin yang, yang kind of thing. So, um, and I, I must say that in all the training I've done, I've trained hundreds of therapists uh, in all you know in Gestalt and all kinds of stuff, really organization development, consulting, and all kinds of things. Um, I always learn as much as I teach. I'm very, I love learning from people. And so every time I do one of these courses or whatever, I'm on the lookout for things that I haven't thought about. Gosh, when I did that paper folding uh, class, uh, which was just recent, so it's in my mind, some of the people there were thinking of ways of doing that that had just not occurred to me. It was so exciting. You know, I just get very uh, uh, excited and enthusiastic about what other people have to offer. Uh, that may not yet be in my wheelhouse. So I don't know, maybe we should stop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm really enjoying the the excitement and I'm just, I'm just tossing the questions out the window in the sense of saying, you know, I, I don't need to know, I mean, you're talking about your challenges, you're talking about some of the ways that all of this has touched you. And I don't want to reduce it just to, you know, gestalt and tell a story and was there a client and I'm just really appreciating the the whole that you're just bringing into this and just sitting with you. Well, again. is there anything I've forgotten to talk about that you usually talk about with people? I don't know. Well, I mean, it was it was a really interesting take on where Gestalt could be going. And you've told me where you're planning on taking some of your work and where it is. Um, and I, I really, I don't have... Um, any specific questions left? I'm just really appreciating you <laughs> and I'm enjoying this. And I, I, I just thought of something that I would mm -hmm. like to mention. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, that's the last one. I, Is there I anything you'd like to add? You know, that's <laughs> I was married for 17 years. Hmm. Uh, my second marriage uh, to a guy I. Uh, where we decided to change the form of our marriage from colleague, from a marriage to a colleagueship and friendship many, many years ago. And we have stayed close friends and colleagues all of this time. And so one of the things I brought into my work was to work with couples who are on the edge of separation or divorce and help them separate the wheat from the chaff. And, uh, understand that there were things about this person that were of value and could still be of value, that it isn't necessarily to throw the whole relationship out. He is world renowned as an information mapping analyst and specialist. He combines art with words and uh, he started doing this before we had any of this. Uh, and he and I work together because on the Myers Briggs, he's a <clears throat> he's a thinking uh, uh, thinking intuitive. I'm a feeling intuitive, 
And uh, so we uh, worked very well together and still do on all kinds of, uh, of projects. Uh, and I have other friends that I've known over my lifetime, you know, long, long friendships, some with men, some with women, some with trans people. Uh, and I love collaborating, all kinds of collaborations. I do it in Second Life, I do it outside of Second Life. Um, and so I want to hold that up too, as a way for people to live in this world now. Uh, that any way that you can find to collaborate with people who, where, with whom you might have some overlap like this, but also who have a skill set or, or knowledge or interests that are different from yours, that they can bring to the party, you know, that, that you then, um, what's the word, you multiply uh, what is possible. Uh, many, more than fourfold, I mean, many, many iterations of what is uh, much more possible than you're trying to work on your own with just your own thoughts and your own talents. Mm -hmm. I think that that sounds very much more enriching than an individualistic, I can do it by myself, I'll work on myself, I'll do it from my own home institute only, and that kind of paradigm. And especially in this day and age that we really need these kinds of collaborations because mm -hmm. like that art project I was talking about, other people will come up with things that never occurred to you mm -hmm. and vice versa, which you then can then create something else wonderful with. Mm -hmm. so. No, I'm, I'm excited about hearing this. I mean, it's, it's collaboration and connectivity and just, again, the depth and the more and more layers. It, it's exciting. This is a very exciting I conversation for me. Lifetime. Oh, <laughs> Heather, I, I don't like the idea of having to give up life. I don't like that. You know, we're asking about aging before. Mm -hmm. that was, that's one thing I don't like that I have to. I mean, I accept death, of course, as part of life, but I don't like the idea. I mean, I called this manual I wrote being alive, mm -hmm. right? And it starts like it's something you're good at. You sound very alive. It started with a, a paraphrase of a quotation from Joseph Campbell that it's not the meaning of life we all seek, but the experience of being alive. And with that, I will let you go, my dear. 